But that being said, I've had groups in the past that have done a fantastic job and never actually spoke to me, so I don't demand it. Uh, but if you do want my advice, I'm more than happy to give it. Make sense? Okay. Good. All right. Today, what we're going to continue doing is our survey of some of the most important civilizations of the ancient world. And today, we land on what is known as the ancient Near East. Um, now, um, you may never have heard the term Near East. And in fact, we really, uh, generally speaking, do not tend to use the term Near East at all these days. Um, it used to be a very common term, but today we usually refer to as uh, the Middle East. Um, but um, the only place that this term is, is preserved is within historical studies of the ancient world, because it's another term that we've been using for so long that uh, it's been difficult to get us in it now. Uh, so it's the only time we'll speak about the ancient, uh, the Near East at all. Um, and uh, this is an area that altogether uh, really was crucial for the development of civilizations, and in particular of all these regions, um, of the, this entire wider range, the, the area that we speak about the most, really we uh, begin to see the earliest sort of flourishing uh, civilization in this wider region, uh, is this area here. An area that we, uh, that's located in modern day Iraq, that is known as, uh, as Mesopotamia. Um, which was a term that was given to this region by uh, the ancient Greeks. Uh, and it's a, a term that refers to the area between the two rivers. And it's the two rivers that we refer to here in the north, the Tigris, and south, the Euphrates. Um, and um, you'll notice here that uh, it may actually appear somewhat surprising to you, uh, the term that is often given to this area, uh, the Fertile Crescent. You can say, well, you know, I've seen pictures of Iraq, and it seems like it's a desert to me. Uh, but that just may show you how much the climate has changed uh, from the ancient world until today. In fact, this was a region uh, that was renowned for the amount of uh, agriculture it was able to produce. And then, in fact, why it ends up becoming so important uh, in ancient civilizations. All of this area, by the way, tends to be uh, very important. Um, one of the regions where we really see a lot of concentration is especially here um, in the south, uh, where you can just see by um, the, the map, there's, and there's even more water available. Uh, this area in the south called Sumer, the southern region of Mesopotamia, uh, which is even among an area that was already rich, uh, even richer in agriculture. Now, um, as we've seen in other places, you should not think of this development of agriculture as being an easy process. Um, there really was a very long amount of time to be able to figure out basic things like, how do you get the water to your farm? How do you create um, reservoirs? How do you create um, canals? And in fact, we actually can see them here, uh, again, just uh, creating, uh, scratching out basically examples of how these kind of irrigation systems work uh, to be able to get the water to their crops. And as in other places, we imagine that in the ancient Near East, they had to go through that process of trial and error to find out which crops work. The answer, uh, as in many most places, wheat, um, peas, uh, barley, uh, all of these things uh, really end up uh, becoming uh, the staples of the diet of this region. I should say, too, that uh, we tend to think that um, what I'm telling you here, that um, this is an area in which you could do good farming, was not a secret to them either. It was not a secret to people outside of this region. And in fact, this is one of the first regions in the world that we can really begin to say that this was an area in which lots of immigrants began to come to this area uh, for, for the opportunity, more or less, uh, because uh, they knew that they could set up a farm there, uh, they knew they could grow. And so we see all sorts of uh, different peoples uh, beginning to come together and create this kind of melting pot uh, in, uh, especially in Mesopotamia, uh, the entire ancient Near East as well. Uh, and I would get some evidence, in fact, of uh, people uh, bringing different languages and customs together. Uh, we think that uh, uh, all of these situations, uh, all of this sort of uh, 
uh, this intensive agriculture meant, as in other places, uh, that the people in this region could produce surplus, so more food than you needed to strictly survive. Uh, and uh, the benefit of this is in other places is that when you have excess of grain, uh, this is money, more or less. You can use this, this money, this extra wealth, uh, to be able to do uh, interesting things. Um, it is fair to say, um, but before I move off this um, theme, though, uh, that we tend to think that this area uh, as a whole was not just rich, uh, but it really was an example, just in terms of the the large scale projects that had to be uh, that had to be done to be able to make this manageable, to be able to farm at this degree, to build the kind of monuments I'll show you, uh, means that uh, in essence the uh, the immigration worked. Uh, the, the amount of the people coming together uh, seemed to get along relatively well, or else these sort of collective projects they done were completely fall apart. Uh, people were not getting along relatively well. One of the great uh, problems of success that I mentioned to you earlier uh, is that, of course, uh, no one wants to leave you alone. Uh, and um, this was true of Mesopotamia. And uh, what we're going to see, in effect, is that uh, this area is going to get sucked up into a series of much larger empires uh, that are going to recognize the same thing I've just been discussing to you, which is to say this is an area that's good to own, uh, because then you could uh, take advantage of it, its great wealth. And uh, there are actually, um, if we were having a whole course on this, there's a whole series of uh, different empires of uh, different sizes that we can discuss that arise in precisely this region. Uh, because of time here, I'm just going to look at two particularly good examples of uh, the kind of trend I'm talking about. These sort of empires that rise up uh, in this region and begin to swallow it alive. The first of these two is known as the Assyrian Empire. And uh, the Syrians themselves, uh, you're looking at here, uh, this is the, uh, the extent of their empire. Uh, which was enormous, and in essence uh, will, at its height, bring together uh, all of the Near East into one political organization. It was, it was not built overnight, and you can see by this handy-dandy sort of chart, uh, that you can see that uh, there's sort of, uh, there, uh, the empire grows in time, uh, success leads to later success. The, the people who would form uh, the core ethnic group, the Assyrians uh, in the Assyrian Empire, uh, come from northern Mesopotamia. So the northern region of this area we're talking about. Um, what we begin to see is that uh, in part because initially of trade, uh, and encouraging trade, um, the Assyrians end up having a lot of money in addition to just the money that they have in agriculture. And this allows them then to begin to go on the war path. They use that money then uh, and uh, begin to convert it uh, to create one of the great armies, uh, one of the greatest armies that ancient world has seen so far. Uh, this was an army that was a professional army. This was not just a matter uh, of uh, a few people banding together. Uh, this was a state-sponsored army um, that uh, had um, that was extremely well organized. That begins to forcibly draft people uh, so that they have enough numbers. Uh, they have officers, and as we'll see in a moment, uh, they have uh, very professional techniques and weapons that they use. Uh, just to give you some idea of the size of this army, we're not talking about a modern army. In scope uh, probably only around 50,000 people. But in comparison to any army of its day, it would have been vast in size. Uh, and so that helps to explain some of its overwhelming victories uh, over people. They could simply overwhelm them the number of human beings. In addition to that, we think that the Assyrians used their money to build up a weapons of iron, for instance. Um, you can see here. Um, Iron weapons. Uh, there's the Assyrians marching into battle with spears that also have iron on them. Um, they also, um, I know this looks kind of like a tank, um, not quite a tank, uh, but it, it really uh, it, it serves uh, 
that serves the purpose uh, of, of destroying the walls of a city. This is kind of the thing that created siege artillery. Uh, and uh, this is very uh, important for ancient warfare because um, one of the techniques you could use to try to your best to hold out against an army was to not face them in battle, but to simply retreat behind your walls in siege and hope that they would go away. Um, and um, one of the ways the Assyrians that have to use to be able to do it uh, to counteract this is that they create these machines that can bash down people's walls, but then they can send in the army and kill everybody. That's just as, as glorious as it sounds, but uh, it worked. Uh, here again, uh, and this is uh, one of uh, these scenes uh, of what would happen um, after um, uh, after the Assyrians had managed to take a city. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a moment. What are the um, the secret weapons, if you will, for the Assyrians? And it's going to seem kind of funny to you. Um, but one of the weapons that set them apart from some of uh, the other peoples that they were trying to conquer uh, is something that you may be considered to be a wimpy weapon, but it wasn't for them. Uh, and that was a chariot. So why a chariot? Well, first of all, uh, chariots were built. The Assyrians built them in a way that they were um, they were light, they were fast. Uh, and um, one of the, the great parts about chariots uh, is that... Um, You'll, you'll get some sense of this from one of their own carvings. You could have one guy uh, in the, the camp whose only job was to drive a horse, and you have another person who could shoot bows and arrows. Uh, so in terms of a, a military technique, they could rush on the battlefield as fast as possible with their horses going. They could have arrows just sort of raining down upon the people who they're trying to fight. Uh, so before they even actually came hand-to-hand -hand fighting, they'd already killed all. Uh, most of their enemies. Uh, and uh, this was considered to be a weapon of terror in uh, the Assyrians' time. Uh, they were using this terror technology before anybody else was. Yeah, please. Why is there a person underneath? <laughs> this, this poor guy has really gotten the worst of this battle. Uh, yes, this, this guy, not only does he have um, an arrow in his head <laughs> and, and his, his buttocks, but um, he's also I mean, run over simultaneously by the force. So he's basically having the definition of a bad day. Um, <laughs> what they're trying to show, in essence, is that it's just a sign that they're completely vanquishing their enemies um, by these techniques. Question? Did they also do chariot races, or is that just a thing? Um, they do. Uh, they do sometimes do chariot racing. Um, and in fact, if you've seen it in the movies, you've probably seen Romans who do it with an even greater passion. Uh, but um, uh, in, in fact, um, none of this would have been possible without the, the, the initial development of chariots. We think that, um, in addition uh, to you know, just simply destroying people on the battlefield, uh, we do think that the Assyrians. Um, were smart enough to create a system after the fact that would allow them to control these regions they had taken. They first of all would have governors. They had to be Assyrian ethnically, so they had to come from the, the ruling people. And what they would do was, and this was um, again fiendishly clever, uh, is um, they figured that when they took a region, they didn't want any resistance. And so what they would tend to do is that they would take some of, uh, especially the, the elite peoples in the region, and they would forcibly deport them to another region of their empire. And uh, the goal was that those people would no longer uh, know the terrain, they wouldn't have a, a sort of a, a support system in the region. Uh, they, they, in effect, would be uh, really um, still finding their way around this new region that they were, uh, they were forcibly brought to. Uh, and they, they felt that this would help to clamp down rebellions. Uh, against their reign. So there was a sort of a psychological element as well in controlling the people. It wasn't just a matter of killing them. Those who survived also got a law deal. When all of um, this system, uh, when the Assyrians were successful in all of these battles, um, they brought the Near East together, they created again a, a system in which everyone had to look to the Assyrian emperor as the prime source of law, source of ruling. Uh, they also 
had a system in which there was a lot of movement. Soldiers and other people would constantly move around. So it wasn't a provincial empire. It was an empire that brought together uh, a very large region. And there was a common tongue, uh, Aramaic. Aramaic uh, is, a, is a language uh, that uh, again, was a, the Assyrians had used previously. Subject peoples in the empire um, would basically be forced to use Aramaic uh, to be able to communicate. They didn't have to use it at home, but to be able to, for instance, speak to their uh, rulers, they did have to learn about Aramaic or to do trade and things like this. And that has sort of international play, you might say. And Aramaic is the language that uh, has a Semitic language related to the Hebrew. Another of the things, of course, that came from empire, uh, when you have a lot of money to take from people, you're able to build enormous monuments all over the place. And we know the Assyrians were great um, uh, monument builders, uh, many of which are both of these monuments. Um, very clearly were meant to commemorate either the ruling family or the major gods that they worshipped. Uh, in fact, often together. I, I give you this one example because at first you may chuckle and think this looks ridiculous. Uh, but uh, this is exactly the kind of propaganda that the Assyrians put up. This actually is an interesting example because um, it's, a, a, of course, a fanciful creature. Part of it is a bull. Part of it uh, is uh, some sort of bird, and part of it, uh, this is actually the head uh, of a real Assyrian emperor. Unless you think this looks and makes him look like an idiot, really what this was meant to do was to stress his enormous power. And in fact, we know that the bull was viewed as an animal uh, of great strength, destruction. Uh, so in fact, it was meant to uh, uh, emphasize that. Uh, but also, you know, his ability to fly is well as supernatural almost power uh, that he had. Another great thing you can have with money uh, or is a court. Uh, you know, the Assyrian Emperor has a very rich court um, that, among other things, has its own library. Um, and uh, the, the Assyrians actually, uh, uh, in spite of their reputation uh, for being just vicious killers, they were that too, um, they also wanted to preserve culture. And uh, the Assyrians actually would go around and collect um, various uh, texts, uh, some of them literary texts, uh, some of them uh, scholarship, some of them uh, really uh, really were administrative documents to just to say how the empire is supposed to run. And they put it all together in one place. And uh, we've actually, in the modern period, we've rediscovered um, large portions of this library. Um, so that we have to reconstruct some of the uh, things that had once been in it. Um, altogether, we think that the Assyrians had a very impressive regime um, in terms of uh, its size, in terms of its wealth, but uh, as all of you know, probably uh, money can't buy love. Uh, and uh, we do think that the, these kind of brutal methods that the Assyrians tended to use meant that no subject people were ever happy to be part of this empire. Uh, in fact, and in time, in fact, a series of rebellions throughout the empire uh, became so damaging that they ended up bringing the entire structure of the government down. Uh, it collapses. In case you worry, though, um, when one empire falls, there's always another one to take its place. Uh, and uh, here I'll talk about the uh, kind of the other big dog uh, when it comes to uh, the ancient Near East in terms of empires. Uh, these are people known as the Neo-Babylonians, the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Um, which you can see, by the way, um, in the overall map, it's slightly smaller in size. It still brings together almost the entire uh, Near East together. Um, the Neo-Babylonians never take Egypt, uh, whereas the Assyrians actually do take Egypt. So that was a, a one big difference geographically between these two empires. The Neo-Babylonians um, also are people who ethnically or uh, come uh, initially from the, uh, the region of Mesopotamia. They, however, came from the southern region of Mesopotamia before they begin uh, their campaigns of conquest uh, to bring their empire to a much larger size. So again, Mesopotamia still is the key in this region uh, because of its wealth. 
in, in many ways, I don't have to spend as much time talking about the Neo-Babylonians because they use some of the exact same methods of the Assyrians. Um, it, it, same methods in terms of conquest and ruling, really. Uh, and uh, if there is an innovation by the Neo-Babylonians, uh, it is less in terms of military or really government in most ways. Uh, and it's more in terms of showing off wealth. Uh, the Neo-Babylonians were really great believers in the fact that if you have great wealth, you should flaunt it. You should show off the glory of your empire, and that's one of the ways you can impress uh, other people. And we know that this is particularly true of the capital city of the Neo-Babylonian empire, known as Babylon. If you have heard of the city of Babylon, you've heard it through uh, the eyes of biblical authors who view Babylon as a sinful city because, in fact, it was the capital city of uh, their enemies. Uh, Babylonians themselves, the Neo-Babylonians, would not have thought it sinful. Of course not. Uh, they, thought, they would think they were the newest and greatest thing, uh, and they were showing off just how wonderful they were. Um, the, the legendary wealth uh, of the city of Babylon comes in part from trade, a lot also from conquest. There's an uh, enduity from war, uh, the combination of the two. I can't show you all that much about this. I can show you, however, um, just to give you some sense of how much money we have at stake here. Uh, these are only a small portion of the walls of the city of Babylon that once stood. In the modern period, uh, Germans decided to cart off the walls with them and bring them back to Germany so you can go see them there today. Uh, this is what Babylon looks like today. Less impressive. From literary descriptions of the time, though, we know that even in addition to these enormous walls, there were palaces, uh, supposedly uh, were temples all over the place, thousands of them, gold, silver, um, thousands of statues. So it really was intended, uh, calibrated to impress you, the visitor, uh, about uh, their wealth and uh, their power. Uh, these are reconstruction of a portion of um, the city. In addition to, a, uh, again, a really a uh, very strong capital city, um, we also have um, a very clear link uh, between um, the human ruler and one of uh, their major gods. In fact, there is a patron god uh, to the Neo Babylonians, uh, the god known as Marduk. Uh, he was the patron god of the empire. Um, a god that, by the way, um, really uh, combines some very interesting things. Um, you'll notice he has a water bucket. Um, Marduk was in part a god of water and vegetation, which you may think, again, sounds kind of weak, but without a vegetation, you're dead. Uh, there's no food. So that is actually a useful skill to have. Uh, Marduk is also a god of judgment. And he's often depicted, as he is here, um, in battle as well, fighting. Uh, so he is a very interesting combination, and a god that really uh, the Neo Babylonians felt uh, was a good model for their emperor. Under. He really prays, he's, he's devoted to this god. Supposedly, Morgan has brought him all of his success in battle or otherwise. This will let you know, by the way, because everyone always asks this um, what this thing is that you're looking at. Um, in the ancient Near East, um, they didn't have calling cards and they didn't have signatures. Uh, if you wanted to identify yourself, what they had were these small things the size of thimbles. Um, that what they would do is carve and reverse these little seeds. And if you needed to sign your name, what you would do is they would get out clay, obviously clay that had not been hardened yet, and they would roll their little uh, thimble uh, across it and it would create this little seed. They all had different seeds on them uh, to, to prove who you are, your identity in particular. We have hundreds of these still say. Uh, so they're kind of a neat source. This is just more than the battle, but there's lots of other examples as well. Uh, and uh, we, we do think, uh, generally, um, we do think that um, in the ancient Near East, uh, people do tend to, these uh, kings do tend to think that there's a connection between them and uh, the divine, that they are hoping to call upon more judgment in their own and, and abilities in their own lives. To give you just one example of, of one of these rulers um, from the Neo-Babylonian Empire, this is a very ruined 
um, example of the image of Nebuchadnezzar the second, uh, who, as most neo babylonian emperors, was known primarily as a warrior, and uh, he was good at it, which is the reason why he's commemorated as such. And uh, among his, he actually uh, goes to war, for instance, against Egypt, not with complete success, but he does. Uh, and at another point, he actually, um, if you want to know uh, what emperor was responsible for the destruction of uh, the temple in Jerusalem, it was Nebuchadnezzar. Lest you think he was, uh, he, he did nothing uh, that you may actually admire, um, he also, uh, he ends up building a very ser uh, famous series of gardens uh, in Babylon. This is, uh, he helps to beautify it as well, some of the money they had taken in war. Fortunately, for Nebuchadnezzar II, he also suffered from periodic uh, bouts of insanity, which really limited his uh, usefulness as uh, being an emperor altogether, uh, but it also makes him interesting for us, too, so it's another reason I mention him. All right, so I talked a little bit then about these em em big empires. Uh, what was the society like more generally in the ancient Near East? Um, how does it look? It's really relatively well, early stage of civilization. The answer is that, as with most places with civilization, you get cities. And the ancient Near East um, really begins to have cities pop up all over the place. Uh, and really, in some cases, very dense urban areas. We begin to see, too, a lot of those sort of um, uh, those products you may associate with cities that are produced by people uh, who have specialized jobs. Um, like, for instance, pottery. Um, we have pottery all over the place from the ancient Near East, which is very useful to have. Um, and really, uh, in many cases, really just mass-produced pottery. They have a very standard way they do it with, on a wheel. And the pottery um, can be basically cranked out, looking very similar at this point. Um, here's another example. Again, sometimes they have little images on the pottery, too. Uh, we have all sorts of examples of people um, can be from clothing, uh, woodworking, masonry. All of these become major arts in these cities uh, in the ancient Near East. Especially for our purposes, one of the things that people are interested in the ancient Near East is this mastery of metalworking. Uh, metalworking, of course, uh, we talk about really very often in the context of weapons and armor. Uh, but once you have those abilities, you can also just um, create things like, for instance, this is a um, occult image of God, rulers, you can create images, uh, you can create uh, jewelry, all of these things are possible uh, once you master metal. People in the ancient Near East also um, devise efficient means of transportation. Um, wheeled carts come into, uh, into use which of course for the purpose of trading. Uh, if you want to trade anything for any distance at all, you need to have a wheeled cart to be able to bring it somewhere. On top of that, we also know uh, that there begins to be uh, the building of ships and long distance trading that also occurs on, uh, on the seas as well. Uh, and, and initially we think a lot of these sort of um, uh, these vessels were really little more than canoes, but in time they begin to experiment with things that are slightly bigger to ship uh, larger materials outside the ancient Near East. Uh, and, if, and we even have evidence of um, basically caravans or these sort of groups of traders coming together to go, for instance, together to, the, to India to trade and then come back again. Uh, so they become quite good at this sort of thing. Here's just an example of a trader uh, in gold. We also have a society uh, that, for all intents and purposes, really was uh, um, an extremely stratified society in which everyone was in really a very clearly uh, demarcated group. Uh, with uh, the people we talk about the most, just as in Egypt, for instance, are the people at the top of the ladder, uh, kings and nobles. And really, a lot of our artwork and, and uh, what written work we have focuses on their deeds. And some, again, it, it, really, uh, their deeds, of course, are protected as being improbable to us, to say the least. I show you this example because I, 
well, yes, it's kind of kick-ass in a way, but um, you see um, there's an emperor here who um, at simultaneously is strangling a, a lion, uh, running it through the sword. He, this poor lion also has an arrow from its head, presumably shot from uh, this guy. Um, and uh, believe it or not, uh, lion hunting was an actual thing uh, in, for emperors uh, in the ancient years. Um, they probably were not this good at it, uh, but um, it gives you some idea of the image they were trying to portray of themselves. And I mentioned you earlier too, we have a lot of images too of um, the, the emperors communing with the gods, or in fact, uh, really in some ways, being almost inseparable from the gods, like in Egypt, uh, that, that they in fact could be worshipped too. Uh, and uh, in addition uh, to simply um, kings too, other important people in the society that pop up a lot in our, uh, our sources uh, are priests. Um, the rulers in the, in the ancient Near East uh, were under uh, under no delusion the fact that they were they were not the ones in control. They really felt uh, that it was the gods who helped them, uh, and uh, without the support of the gods, very quickly they felt things could uh, reverse themselves. Uh, and so it was very important uh, to be able uh, to give basically a bankroll priests to be able to pray to the gods on their behalf. Uh, so then they would continue to enjoy, enjoy the same success. So in many cases, um, priests were movers and shakers in the society. They had money, uh, they had government uh, government support, um, and uh, they were the ones who very often um, um, are, are uh, in some cases, the powers behind the throne. Right. This is just one, again, of those, those roll seals. Um, that shows you an image of a, we think a moon priest doing something we don't know. Uh, some sort of rituals can happen. In addition to these other people, we do think uh, that uh, there is a whole constellation of people who we rarely see in our sources whom we know were there. Uh, like, for instance, uh, there were free peasants, most of whom were farmers, but we also have people who are craft makers as well in society. Um, we rarely pop up, but they are there. Uh, we also see um, that there are slaves who, uh, pick, uh, who we see periodically as well, probably usually as a result of um, war. Slaves. On all levels of society, and this is something in, you remember from Egypt too, uh, we tend to think uh, that although women uh, were, were certainly there, we think that uh, politics and war were a man's game. Um, although we do also have examples of uh, some women you know, who became advisors to kings. Uh, but you have priestesses uh, and other women in various jobs, like uh, midwives or uh, in some cases shopkeeping. Or, or so, uh, they certainly are uh, important as well. Just as I had mentioned to you earlier uh, for Egypt, um, the ancient Near East would be uh, unthinkable without huge monumental structures. Well, many of not been as preserved as well, uh, some of those. Uh, and uh, it, just as people come together to build, for instance, huge irrigation systems, uh, we think that people uh, come together to build huge monuments, sometimes to rulers, sometimes to gods, sometimes they're basically interchangeable, um, the two of them. Uh, the the uh, aim of uh, the, uh, the monuments. Um, I can't go through many of these, but to give you just one example of one of the, the more iconic uh, monuments that comes up in society, uh, this is something known as the Ziggurat of Ur. Uh, it's from um, the area of Sumer in the southern region of Mesopotamia. Uh, and uh, it has been partially rebuilt in the modern period. These are American GIs going up to the Ziggurat of Ur. The Ziggurat of Ur is a step pyramid. So you can see a pyramid is going up. That's really all the Ziggurat is. Um, and uh, what's interesting too about if you, you were to look inside this, um, it's a very interesting sort of uh, multi use building. On the one hand, there were altars inside the Ziggurat that priests could use to be able to carry out their rituals to, to uh, honor the gods. On the other hand, there were these vast rooms inside the ziggurat that appeared to have no purpose. And people wondered initially, why did they build these, these huge empty rooms? Uh, and what we really figured out in time is that 
Um, these were also areas in which you could store wheat. Um, and uh, it may give you an idea of just how important these priests were, that they actually were overseeing uh, granaries as well. They were the ones keeping a lot of the wealth uh, in these kind of temples. So there was no separation between uh, worship and uh, keeping, you know, keeping the goods. Other things that people built in society are clear are walls. You need walls for the fence, in addition to just uh, monuments of that, like the ziggurat. Right. What are some of the cultural achievements then of the ancient Near East? The number one thing that are produced that is produced by the ancient Near East uh, that still is useful to you today is writing. Uh, this is uh, the area in which the writing is first discovered, and. Uh, um, it, it, what's very interesting about this is that, uh, again, we think that um, this is something that people uh, begin to develop largely um, for business purposes or accounting purposes. Um, the purpose of, of writing initially is not to necessarily record high culture. It is to say, okay, um, you know, we have a contract. I give you this, you give me that. This is the work I'm doing here and how much you're paying me to have a record of that. And gradually, then, once you have writing, it could be used for things like you know, writing uh, mythology or things like that. Our earliest writings look like this. Um, they are on clay that uh, um, eventually has hardened, of course. Uh, and uh, um, the form of writing in these earliest documents uh, is something referred to as cuneiform. Um, this is not a language. It's somewhat confusing. A cuneiform is a method for writing. So it's like our alphabet. But you can write many different languages using cuneiform. And the term cuneiform itself uh, comes, you notice how these kind of look like little wedges, some of uh, the, uh, uh, the writing. And so in fact, it comes from a Latin term that means the wedge-shaped form of writing. That's basically all cuneiform means. Uh, we tend to think that, uh, uh, again, many of our documents are administered in nature. The rulers were thought to use cuneiform uh, to be able to send letters. It also, in time, um, uh, literature uh, and um, religious documents start to get written down, too. I mean, anything I know about, for instance, about the, uh, these gods that I'm talking about usually comes from one of these cuneiform tablets that's been preserved. Um, and, uh, we'll hear more about that, of course, on Friday, one of the biggest are the best sellers really in ancient Greece. Other uh, kinds of, um, uh, of things that can be done with writing are technical inventions. Uh, and uh, really, uh, in some ways, the ancient Near East, they founded modern mathematics in some ways with uh, the decimal system, um, which initially was just used, for instance, to show how much work people had done uh, in increments. Uh, we know some scholars uh, begin to invest themselves in astronomy, um, in, in part simply um, to, to know how to plant and harvest crops, uh, but as uh, the term astronomy applies, they also seem to believe that if you knew something about the stars, when people were born, it would tell something about their fate. Uh, so that was important to know for that reason. Altogether, um, for all these measurements in mathematics in the ancient Near East, um, the base number uh, that they used was not the number 10, uh, but the, the base was the, uh, the number 6, uh, which is part of the reason why, if you've ever been curious, for instance, um, why we have like, you know, uh, 60 seconds in a minute or um, 60 minutes in an hour, or for instance, uh, 360 degrees in a circle. Uh, it's because we're working basically on a base that it was created in the ancient Near East. Um, all of them are divisible by six. We also know that the ancient Near East was a place of law and advances in law. And in fact, for today, you've read uh, in part uh, one of the most famous of these legal codes, known as the Code of Hammurabi, uh, which was created by one of these uh, small time kings or leaders. Uh, in uh, Mesopotamia, before Mesopotamia became swallowed up in larger empires. Uh, and uh, just to give you some idea of what it looks like, here is the Code of Hammurabi. Uh, 
may not be as impressive. We've met a lot of laws, but this is the top, and this ruler is getting um, this sort of rod of power from the sun god. Um, the reason, um, the Code of Hammurabi, I go on and on about it. Um, the reason why it's a, a really a fascinating law source is that um, we've actually discovered examples of many of these laws in different places, in tablets, for instance, in the ancient Near East. And we don't think most of these laws are particularly original. Um, and again, you've gone over some of these, um, what these laws uh, were, like for instance, um, they, uh, there's a lot of these laws, for instance, uh, really aims at some of the uh, criminal things like murder, theft, false accusations. You may notice too that how harsh the punishments are for most of the things. I mean, death is a very common punishment in part because they don't have prisons. Um, so you have to do something with the people. Um, so they usually go at, as high as possible in terms of, uh, but there are also things having to do with um, civil laws. Uh, uh, what are prices for certain things? How, how, what are the wages people get paid? Uh, how does marriage take, uh, take place? All these kinds of things uh, are dealt with the law. The, the reason we think that this law code is so innovative is not so much that these laws have, uh, were uh, new to this document. But the reason we think it's very interesting is that they put these laws publicly and they posted them so everyone could see them. And with the implication that these laws are meant to apply to everyone equally. You can see, you know, everyone can actually see the law and have reference to the law. So the implication is at least that um, law was not simply a matter of you know, treating your friends and family well. This was meant to be something that eventually was ordained by the gods, that the rulers were supposed to uh, publicize and enforce, and it was supposed to apply to everyone equally. Uh, we don't know if that actually was the case, that the law functioned as well uh, as it was written, but that at least is the goal, seemingly, of this, or else there'd be no point in, in posting it in these public places uh, so everyone could see it. Uh, and that, in fact, I mean, uh, we know that everyone theoretically could appeal to the king if they got judgment they didn't like. Uh, and even slaves in the society had retained some legal rights. Uh, women had significant rights in this document, or for instance, their own children. Uh, so, even classes you may think that the ancient world were disadvantages had some law uh, that applied to them specifically. None of this, again, is ideal, uh, I should say, but uh, it was an advance over previous laws. As many of you will know, too, um, the East Near East is a place in which there were very interesting advances in religion. Uh, there was a huge constellation of different gods and goddesses that people worshipped, uh, and uh, especially identified with all sorts of natural phenomena, uh, the sky, water, storms, elemental things that are important to worship, of course, because um, people knew how close they lived uh, to the ground, to agriculture, and one bad season could kill everybody. So it was important to keep those prayers going. Uh, and uh, I mean, some people have described this system of belief as a very simple one, being that you know, I give something to you, I give you prayers and offerings, and the gods then will give something to me in return. Uh, so this is sort of tit for tat. Uh, and uh, we really see that um, people in the society uh, believe that temple uh, temples uh, were actually where gods would come and visit to sort of uh, regular basis. And people had to offer them things like uh, meals, music, rituals, uh, all of these things. Um, and uh, the public festivals where everyone would you know, come and, and gather uh, and give praise to the gods. And again, that was the key to survival, uh, if you want to get the gods on your side. Um, and uh, if you did submit to the gods, you did these rituals, especially sacrifice of animal, uh, then the gods would hopefully be happy and you'd gain prosperity in the long life. If you neglected them, what happened was your own fault. All right. um, this last one is just a, a warning warning. I include if you're enjoying it. It really has no benefit uh, other than that, but um, there you go. The last thing I want to talk about here uh, a little bit uh, is a topic I, I say to the end, it's probably something a lot of you already know a lot about. Uh, this is the question of how does ancient Israel fit in this uh, ancient areas that I've just been describing to you. Um, it is fair to say, as you can see on this map, that um, it's even a little misleading to talk about ancient Israel as being a very unified kingdom of the period we're discussing. And in fact, for the majority of its existence, 
Um, there were two separate kingdoms, oh, uh, one in the north known as Israel, one in the south known as Judah, only brought together for really basically a king and a half, uh, so a relatively limited period of time. The kingdom of Israel was a relatively small uh, but really respectable kingdom uh, in the ancient Near East. It would, did not hold a candle to people like the Assyrians and Neo-Babylonians in terms of their political might. Um, it was a relatively limited population in Israel, uh, and uh, the temple, the great the temple you always read about in the Bible, probably would have looked to you like a small village church. I mean, we're not talking about something uh, that was as impressive as some of the great palaces of Babylon or something, because they didn't have that amount of money to build anything that big. The reason we still talk about ancient Israel has absolutely nothing to do with their political or military significance in the ancient Near East, and this has more to do uh, with the development of their beliefs in ancient Israel and how they were marked out uh, from other people in their own civilization. And we know about this a lot, of course, uh, if not just, of course, the continuity of belief, but also because a lot of this was written down. But, Historians usually refer to as the Hebrew Bible, uh, Christians refer to as the Old Testament. Neither term is, is great. Hebrew Bible implies it's all written in Hebrew, and actually some of the Old Testament is written in Aramaic, uh, so it's not an ideal term, but I digress. The importance, of course, uh, in the Bible, as you can see, uh, is that uh, the peach of ancient Israel, their, their god, uh, was Yahweh, uh, and they had gained kind of special relationship with it. And in fact, um, the earliest documents seem to imply that the people of ancient Israel thought uh, that there were many gods, but only Yahweh was the important god, the god that they worshipped. But in time, there's a progression to um, beginning to abandon the idea of polytheism entirely and reject the fact that there are many gods, and beginning to focus, say, that there is in fact only one god, monotheism. And uh, we know that in addition to embracing this idea of monotheism, people in ancient Israel uh, felt they had, ex uh, had um, a close relationship with him, and if they did things for him, he would give them uh, prosperity, um, they would give them uh, children, and that uh, continued relationship. What's very uh, interesting about um, Yahweh in terms of um, uh, the documents we have is that um, they were... The people of ancient Israel felt that unlike the, all of the other gods in ancient Near East, Yahweh could not be depicted in the form of an image, which is a weird idea in the ancient Near East. Um, we've only found one, uh, one image of Yahweh for uh, all of the looking we've done, um, which means that this is a largely successful prohibition against depicting him. Uh, and uh, uh, to give you some idea, a, a god like this, a storm god known as Baal here, um, who's an enemy god in the Bible, these little images appear all over the place in the ancient Near East. Everyone had a little idol. Uh, so to say that you couldn't depict a god in an image was a weird idea. Uh, so god was, uh, Yahweh was transcendent. The other strange thing about Yahweh was that um, there's always a, a social uh, sort of a element, social justice element to his worship. He, for instance, had to take care of uh, populations like, for instance, widows and orphans. Uh, there was a moral component to belief in him. It wasn't just a matter of doing a sacrifice, for instance. Um, as many of you will know, unfortunately, um, uh, the history of ancient Israel is not often a happy one. Uh, and in fact, uh, eventually, um, uh, in addition to splitting up into two individual kingdoms, Israel and Judah, uh, Assyrians will eventually attack uh, the northern part of Israel, and as they did in other places, uh, they destroyed uh, they destroyed Israel and deported many of its people. And in the south, Judah it would survive a little bit longer, but the other empire we discussed, the Neo-Babylonians, would end up conquering them, destroying the temple, uh, and then, in effect, also deporting many of their people. Uh, so this is, uh, in effect, um, uh, why, at the end of this period, uh, ancient Israel was not only a small player, but in fact uh, had ended up uh, being destroyed as a result of uh, these, uh, these wars with the much larger powers uh, of its time. 
Hey, final questions about anything? Again, just one final reminder. Please do remember uh, that you have coming up uh, the presentation on Friday. Other than that, I will see you then. Thank you, folks. <coughs>